something was going to happen. Something wonderful. G'day, fans. <laughs> I tell you what, I hear that nerds as well, and I think, you know, that's just, like, so true to life. Because look at that. We have barely started, and we've got people watching us already, you suckers. There we go. All right, so we're going to have a bit of a chat, a bit about our first of our conversations, and fan is a bit of a stretcher like that. So, uh, MPS, I'm going to pass this one over to you, because this was actually one of your ideas, uh, and you can uh, send us off regarding um, your topic, please. Go for it. All right, if you want to put that up for me, please, when you get a second. Uh, I'm just trying to find the other document. There we go. What we basically were going to talk about was when an actor gets replaced in a TV series or movie series because it happens all the time for various reasons. And some are obvious, some are not so obvious. Uh, there are reasons why actors leave or are replaced. Uh, some are good reasons, some are not so good reasons. And we're going to have a look at see who got replaced and when and where so um some obvious ones we'll start with and we're not i wasn't going to talk necessarily about people who were in pilot episodes and got replaced you know like um uh who was that woman that got replaced then by um kate mulgrew for voyage i can't remember her name the french lady oh, yeah. uh, um, so things yeah. like something to bar. Bar. yeah 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 I was thinking more along the lines of, well, here's one. Here's a good one for you. Superboy, The Adventures of Superboy. Back in the 80s, there were two different Superboys, same show, and the only person that stayed um, uh, central to the characters was Stacey Haddock's character of Lois Lane, but two very different-looking actors. In actual fact, the guy on the left of screen was the better looking of the super Superboys, but the guy on the right was a better actor, I, th I found. So... Uh, I can't find the reason why they switched, but they did switch. Uh, and some of these reasons I can't explain to you why they did, but they did. Still, he looks pretty close, although I don't know. What do you guys think of this one? I think you're definitely right. I mean, the guy on the left, he's, he's got the looks, but quite often usually they source those uh, people from, you know, model talent agencies. So uh, it wouldn't be the first um, pretty boy or pretty girl that's been cast only to find out the acting's a bit on the wooden side. So I suspect it was more looks than, um, you know, talent. So I would yeah. have said the best thing would to do was, to, you know, go with the person you're going to love, not the person that you think is eye candy, but, you know, uh, you know, making it terrible for you. Well, it seemed to me that the first couple of series with this particular guy was pretty average, and then the new guy came in and it just seemed to feel better. It felt like a, a Superboy series. That's just me. The next one, we're going to go back in history. It's from Cousin Marilyn on the Munsters. There was a definite replacement uh, in there. Uh, and apparently um, the first the first uh, actress, uh, Beverly Owen, um, was miserable about being based out in California. Uh, where she was based, where she loved New York, so she left the show. Um, yeah, that was a bit of a different one. I think that was one of the, the first ones I remember where there was a difference in a show having different actors. Here's a, here's a bit of trivia for you. You know, uh, one of the other reasons why she uh, left the show? Because she went off to marry the guy who used to run Sesame Street. So she married, <laughs> oh. she married, uh, married, married big there and um yeah that's uh, one of the other reasons why she left the show uh, well, you, you learn something else but yeah i kind of like the the first marilyn uh when i remember watching the monsters because i love the monsters it was a great show herman and and um oh now lily lily monster i could remember her name for a second with the dark dark black hair Actually, if I had to, if I had to pick between the two, I actually liked Pat Priest, who was the second one. So she was my favourite out of the two. Okay, I still love the Monster Mobile because that's a George Barris creation. So um, he created the Batmobile. Dude, <laughs> <laughs> 
We'll do cars. All right. <laughs> One of the original series of Superman, the two mm -hmm. lowest lanes. And the one that I remember the most is the one on the right of screen because she also appeared in the Superman movie as Lois Lane's mother. Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. Yes, Noel Neal. So, yeah. Uh, and the first one, uh, Phyllis Coates uh, only played the character for one season uh, and, not, and decided not to come back for the second. She was pursuing other projects and was replaced by... Uh, Noel Neal, as you said, who yeah. out of, uh, out played Lois for the remainder of it. Yeah, out of the two, I think um, Noel Neal was one that really won fans' hearts because when you sort of, sort of saw Phyllis Coates in the beginning, she was a little bit sort of on the colder side, whereas as soon as Noel came in, you know, very much like the girl next door and was fun and good to look at and, uh, yeah, they couldn't have cast better. She was absolutely... Mm. Uh, uh, superior to the original choice. Yeah, she certainly does have that look, and she sort of, yeah, you're right, has that sort of cutesy, you know, could almost butter wouldn't melt in her mouth, but I reckon would still get the story sort of uh, look to her. The next one, this is a series that I loved, and it is science fiction because it goes into time travel, uh, is Goodnight Sweetheart. And the funny thing about this show is halfway through, uh, I think it ran for six years, five or six seasons, halfway through it, the two lead female actors both left and were replaced with two more. Hmm. And they almost looked identical for both of them, which is really the weird part because you sort of, you went from one season to the next one, hang on, why does she sound, they sounded slightly different, but they were almost identical in their looks. Very good. I'm just trying to find my other information uh, because the blonde, uh, if you see the, the blonde with the red jacket, uh, she was the first one and she basically thought that she couldn't um, bring anything else to the character. So not that there was a lot to bring to the character. She was just a, a working 90s chick with a husband that could time travel between uh 1990-ish and 1940s in world war ii which is where the other woman comes in uh and eventually um he he pretends he's a spy back in world war ii uh from mi5 because he knows all the things like when something's gonna get bombed and all that sort of stuff and it's actually um quite a funny series and believe it or not he brings all this stuff back from 19 from the war and sells it in a shop as collectibles, but it's all brand new because he's basically just walked back in time and picked it up and walked away again. There you go. So there you go for your World War II memorabilia. Hmm. This one's a bit of an interesting one. I don't watch Game of Thrones, but apparently they've had three people play this guy, this guy called The Mountain. Um, and it's just... Uh, yeah, I don't know much about it. I don't watch Game of Thrones, but because people do watch it, um, I imagine that these three guys were all quite big guys if he's called the Mountain. I can't imagine him being a midget, one of those yeah. um, you know, ironic sort of names, you know, like someone's missing a hand, they call him Lefty or whatever. <laughs> so, <laughs> but then you've got three different actors playing the same role in the series that still hasn't finished, uh, sorry, that has just finished uh, in recent years. The next one, and I think one of the most disappointing uh, changeovers was in the Dark Knight or the Batman uh, Begins series with uh, Katie Holmes and then um, uh, Maggie Gillen. Right. Right. Maggie. Maggie That's Gillen right, Maggie. I've got it written down over yeah. there. Um, Katie Holmes' character portrayal of, was far superior, was far better, and Maggie's was just terrible. I thought, you know, there was lines in there that I cringe at every time and when i watch the dark knight i imagine katie holmes in that role playing it so much better yeah it was disappointing to see that they did do that and um the completely different looks different characterizations and it does jar the thing a little bit especially when she first appears on screen you go oh, i wonder who this person is oh okay it's the same character from the last movie but it's a different actress it's like considering she only stuck around for one, for one film it wasn't a, it was a shame they couldn't get katie for both of them so but, you know, it is what it is, I suppose. Well, the 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 rumour is that she 
left because she thought she'd done enough in the series. But I heard other rumors that um, it was because when she was married to Tom Cruise, he didn't want her doing another film. Uh, and he was very much, he sort of brought her up in the industry and then sort of said, well, no, nah, you're not doing another, you're not doing a sequel. So mm. don't know how true that is. It is a rumor. And as far as I'm concerned, I think the Dark Knight sort of suffers because of the change of character. Yep, totally agree. One of my favorite series of, of monster movies is The Mummy, Brendan Fraser and Rachel Wise. Uh, the first two were great, and then they changed um, Rachel's character over to this the other one whose name is my, my PC is not running great, so um, <clears throat> to Maria Bello. And quite frankly, the third Mummy film really didn't do it for me. It was just terrible. Sort of harks back to our previous conversations about um, series, movie series that go too long, and you think once they have to start changing, changing actors, especially if an actor, actress, whichever, uh, wants to leave, it's almost like, okay, maybe that's a sign we should just stop and not plow on rather than saying, oh, we'll just recast the part and just move on. Who's going to know? Who's going to care? But clearly the yeah. audience does care. Yeah. Well, it seems that Rachel Wise had um, issues with the script, so and I can see why she left the the movie. Now, this was a bit of an interesting one. I, I didn't really realize this till I, I sort of looked at this, but the two guys that uh, were in Iron Man. So Terrence Howard uh, is the guy on the left and Don Cheadle is the guy on the right. And John Don Cheadle plays far more into the series of the Avengers than, than Terrence Howard does. Um, but yeah, there was apparently a, a bit of a rift with Terence coming back for subsequent films, and um, he actually blamed Robert Downey Jr. for not uh, going to bat with him for him and getting him back on the other films. So, which is a bit of a shame. Mm -hmm. okay. But I think Don Cheadle actually plays a, a decent role in it. You know, he becomes. Um, uh, he puts on one of the other Iron Man suits and and goes from there. Hmm. Harry Potter. And this uh, is a, a case of hmm. when an actor dies during production and you can't really do much about it. So uh, I do think that... I um, uh, can't think of his name. Gambon, Michael Gambon actually plays a rougher, harsher... Um, Dumbledore than than um, Richard did so I didn't really like his Dumbledore as much as as in the first few films. Yeah, I guess they're kind of lucky because you got the glasses and the long beards and I mean young audiences, young people watching the the movies wouldn't probably pick up on the fact that the the actors even changed. Um, so if you're going to have a situation where you have to change cast members, this is probably one of the better ones where you can sort of slip it in and most people, you know, younger people, wouldn't even notice. So um, yeah. That's why it goes. Yeah, but it, it's it it felt weird. It felt sort of different to me. All right, the Hulk films, three different films or three different actors in three different films. The first film I thought was great uh, with Eric Eric Banner. The second one I just didn't do it for me, and yet that's the one that's in the Marvel universe essentially so uh we see that then you've got um a third actor uh playing hulk in which i think he plays the better role out of all three there you go, there you go. so well richard norton hasn't really done much since these films um but mark ruffalo came from next to nowhere and uh turned out to be great as the hulk hmm. it's good uh, and that's all the visuals I got for that one. There are more info, so you can stop sharing that one for me, dude. Cool. Because I've got a few um, I want to bring up. Yep. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Okay, cool. So the thing that kind of bugs me, um, yeah, you're right, is uh, when they change uh, actors in, in shows and you sometimes wonder where it goes. Ironically, on a slightly left field, uh, in the show Roseanne, um, the character of Becky 
was played by an actress, um, Alicia Goranson, and she was in there for a few seasons, but then she got dropped out because of her schoolwork and they replaced her with another actress. Um, and, of course, I guess what – and then they ended up swapping the original one back again and then back again. So it was crisscrossing backwards and forwards because of her schoolwork and her school availability. But I like the fact they were able to make jokes about it within the show and saying, you know, haven't we seen you somewhere before? Or, you know, the cast are watching – the, a TV show, and they all say, don't you hate it when they change an actor midway through the series? And the new actress is saying, oh, no, I know, I kind of like it, which I thought it was actually quite good. There's two that bug the kind of crap out of me, though, in terms of these changes. Um, and one is with, like, Michael Goff, who played Alfred in the, in the 90s Batman films, right? So he plays in four movies, and three of those movies had three different Batmen, right? So you can just imagine it. All of a sudden, one time he's working with Michael Keaton, then he's working with Val Kilmer, and then he's working working with George Clooney. And you'd be thinking, you'd be thinking, am I who's who in the zoo here? There's some dudes be just rolling up and going, who, which one are you? Are you playing Batman today or is are you playing it? It's like, how confusing is that? So I can't imagine how he coped with that with the different actors, sort of like temperaments and the way they looked and sounded and everything. It would have been just like would have been enough to do your bloody head in. So um, one of the cast changes that really pissed me off, and I know the reason why, and all the rest of it, it really gave me the red hot squirts, uh, was in the Star Trek film series. So you had the character of Savick, which is played by <coughs> Kirstie Alley, first premiered by Kirstie Alley in Star Trek Two. They get around to Star Trek Three, the search of Spock, and she's been removed and replaced by Robin Curtis, who not only played the same character, but changed completely the personality of the character. So she didn't even try to replicate what Kirstie had done. She said, no, no, I'll make it more Vulcan-ish rather than more Romulan-esque. And it was a completely different personality. And I'll tell you what, it jarred badly on screen so if you're like me and at the time you're a bit of a Kirsty alley fan you go oh beauty we'll get to see her in the search for spock and you go what the hell is this and it's the same character it just, and uh, that was that was jarring that was hardcore just like just like chalk what is it fingernails on the blackboard type scenario so um yeah i wasn't uh, very very happy with that at all so but anyway that's just me i know it was sort of was quite interesting that in bewitched there were two darrens played by two dicks so to speak. Imagine that. What are the chances that you get two actors with the same first name, uh, Dick York and Dick Sargent? So uh, you could almost say when Dick Sar Sargent comes on and go, what happened to the other Dick? And he said, oh, he had the Dick. So <laughs> you can think of a million jokes of that, couldn't you? So anyway. Dick, so, Dick, um, Dick did. He did. And here's one for you. I know Jeff, I was going to bring this up, uh, and I'll pass it up to him in a sec just for this. So there was a TV <coughs> show called The Tick from 2001, and there were two ticks, right? <laughs> That's just funny. Um, Patrick Warburton. And the other guy from 2016 was Peter Seraf. I can never pronounce his name. Sarah Finovich. Hey, what? Sarah Finovich. Right. What's so famous about him? What's what's the uh, big biggest claim to fame? Well, he's a UK actor. Nope, that's not it. What else? That's not it. His biggest claim to fame. What is his like? Put him on the map. I'm being a bit he's of a bit. He's in Star Wars. Hey, what? He's in Star Wars. And doing what? Doing a very good acting role. <laughs> if, yes, help me out here. What is famous? What is Peter Sarafak and Nakanaka with? What's he famous for in Star Wars? Doing good acting, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> unbelievable. I like what Dave, Dave Bucket, good on you, Dave. Good to see you for the first time. The Sarafak replacement was not logical, totally. So, Peter Sarafak and Nakanaka with, so you wish he had, had a sort of easier name to pronounce was the original voice for Darth Maul. There you go, oh. and the fans met us. Come on, fans! Gee, was how can you not know this stuff? It should be just at the top of your head the whole time. So uh, anyway, whatever. So well, there you go. Anyway, uh, Jeffro, is there any uh, actor changes you want to bring up that have uh, gotten on your goat over the journey? Yeah, I mean, I've noticed that uh, a lot of people are suggesting some good ones that I had actually thought of, so I'm still going to cover them anyway. Um I sort of looked at it in a few different ways, and the first one I looked at was a bit of a twist. Voice artists. So you've got someone like Jim Henson who passes away, and the Kermit role has to continue on amongst all the other roles that Jim played. So the fact that Brian Henson stepped up, I actually found that to be um, quite acceptable because his voice, I guess because of the fact that he's part of the family, you get to hear those tones that, uh, Jim Henson had, and even though uh, Kermit and all that sounded a little bit younger, I thought that was a really good sort of um, uh, swapping of the roles. And same thing goes with um, Mel Blanc, because he did all the voices for Looney Tunes. So when he passed away, Looney Tunes is still going strong. So they got uh, someone like Australian voice artist Keith Scott to do the voices, and 
I guess, because uh, Keith is such a mimic, he mimics Mel Blank's voice so perfectly, half the time you wouldn't even know which one you, you're actually listening to. So voice artists are always an interesting one, and that happens a lot in, um, in the industry. Uh, the other thing I was looking at was the, the movies that became television series. So I'm just going to rattle these off, but uh, generally I found, and this may be my personal opinion, that when they actually did a, a television series, I actually pretty much enjoyed most of them. In fact, you know, right up there, if not sometimes even more so than the actual movies. So um, the ones that I'm going to uh, bring up in my, uh, in my list, uh, and it's going to be alphabetical because I looked it up online, so it's alphabetical, uh, <laughs> is Alienation. So uh, I love the Alienation series, love the actors that uh, did that. They weren't like the original um, actors, which were James Kahn and Mandy Patinkin. I thought they, uh, they really sort of uh, took that role and did so well with that on TV. Uh, Blue Thunder, another one. I thought they did a really excellent job in transposing the, the characters that were in the movie uh, into the, uh, the television um, series. Uh, uh, a really good example is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So uh, not many people tend to remember much about the fact that that was actually a movie and quite a big one with Kirsty Swanson. I mean, the uh, Sarah Michelle Gellar uh, role has really eclipsed the movie, so uh, can say nothing but good things about that uh, particular transaction. Highlander, uh, the fact that that series ran for nine seasons or something like that with Adrian Paul, I mean, that that says how much the fans adopted his characterization of uh, the Highlander to, to great success. Uh, Planet of the Apes, so admittedly we had two different um, uh, characters, so uh, instead of uh, Charlton Heston playing just five, sorry, there was three of them, weren't there, but one died. But uh, the Planet of the Apes television series, I thought was a really good sort of uh, uh, crossover where the, the actors were essentially playing the same sort of astronauts where they've come through and they got stuck on uh, future Earth. thought that was really good. Uh, Robocop. I, not many people remember the Robocop television series, but I did, and I loved the movie, loved Peter Weller, and I thought to myself, how are they going to do any good with this? But I guess because the fact that it's mostly the suit, you don't get to see too much of the actor outside of the suit, that that worked really well. Starman was uh, another one, maybe not quite so good because... Uh, Starman, the movie, really has a fond place in a lot of people's hearts. The television series didn't quite do so well. I think it was only about one season, but I thought that was worth an honourable mention. And uh, finally, Young Indiana Jones. So, of course, we had um, uh, that spin-off from the, uh, the movies, even though it was a very short uh, part of the, uh, the movies, but uh, I loved Indiana Jones, or Young Indiana Jones, as I should say. And as for the um, TV actors, I mean, a lot of people have already mentioned some of these ones. So uh, things like uh, Batman 66, uh, I think it was Colin that might have mentioned it. I mean, we had three different Catwomans. We had Julie Newmar, Eartha Kitt, Lee Merriweather. We had two different Riddlers. So we had Frank Gorshin and um, John Aston. So, you know, they were uh, swapping those guys out all the time. Uh, we've mentioned... And um, and Sorry. three different and, Mr. Freezes. And three different Mr. Freezes. Oh, mm -hmm. well, there you go. So um, I hadn't even thought about that one. Uh, yeah. we, we mentioned the Munsters. Uh, we had um, also mentioned the Tick. Uh, another one was um, Star Trek Next Generation, where we had uh, uh, Beverly Crusher, played by Gates McFadden, actually uh, suddenly disappear. And we have another Doctor. Um, just with a different name. And uh, we know how well that works, so we got Beverly Crusher back. Uh, another swap out was uh, Enchant, where Shannon Doherty sort of, I think, probably cheesed off a few people, and she was given the boot. And next thing you know, we have uh, Rose McGowan playing uh, Paige Matthews, who is the long-lost young half-sister. So it's like suddenly she's out of the picture. Oh, we've got a new actor in. And uh, the... Um, 
yeah, and that's about just having a look at my list here. That's about uh, as far as I've got. So that's my list. Actually, that's very funny because on topic, Colin has already mentioned that in the third Robocop film, they changed the main actor from Peter Weller to the other guy. Mm. So, uh, yeah. yeah, that's really good. Really sick of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I like what Catherine said. Yeah, the Buffy, the movie, yeah, it wasn't very good, was it? You compare it to the TV series and it was like it really jars on you. Um, quite funny, actually. One film that I was thinking of that was turned into a TV series where at least one actor did carry over to both the movie and the TV series was MASH. And, of course, that was uh, Radar O'Reilly. Well, I forgot his real name. Um, Gary Burkoff, that's right. He was the only one who yeah. carried over from the uh, from the movie to the TV series. But, uh, but yeah, by and large, you are correct, though, uh, Jeffro. TV series is can actually improve upon their films because a lot more time to build upon their um, their characters and uh, situations and uh, for that reason can have a really good long life, which is a really, really good to see. So uh, I like what Dave Barker said, state-of-the-art bang, bang. Yeah, good on you, Dave. He's, he's quoting his Robocops. There's a good conversation coming up later on, uh, Dave. Hope you're watching this uh, where uh, fans who take their fanaticism a little too far and using quotes like that might be a good example of that. So uh, there you go. Um, so there were three Mr. Freezes. Otto Preminger was one of them. Who were the other two? Do you remember? Uh, George Sanders and Ally Wallach. Ally Wallach, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I yeah. never remember those names. I tried to write yeah. those ones down. See, it's, it's funny too because they were the three main characters from Batman. It seemed to have happened a lot in the 60s and, and the 50s. So Bewitched had the two different Darrens. It had two different Gladys Kravitz. It had a plethora of um, Tabithas. Uh, and Louise Tate, there was a couple of those. In I Dream of Jeannie, Larry Hagman got uh, uh, moved on after 15 years and then Wayne Rogers took over the role. I think Larry Hagman went on to Dallas uh, there. Uh, Gilligan's yeah. Island, you had two different gingers. Hang on, stop there for a sec. You know what else Larry Hagman in between, did in between I Dream of Jeannie? <laughs> I can't believe when I say this. I Dream of Jeannie and Dallas, he went Superman. and directed Beware the Blob. So there Beware you go. the Blob, oh. yeah. He actually directed it too, I think. It was his only one and only, yeah, one and only effort. So there you go. Keep going, dude. Uh, Gilligan's Island. There were two different, two different gingers, uh, at least. Um, um, I'll pick you up on that one. Uh, right. Tina Louise was throughout the TV series. The other gingers came in the movies that came out about uh, 15, 20 years after that. So, mm. uh, all right, I'm gonna, I'm uh, gonna pick. That's all right. That's fine. Just helping a, a brother out sort of thing. Hang on, um, hang on. And the Lone Ranger. Hang on, stop for a sec. Stop, stop, stop. You've got a bit of contention here because someone has said, hang on, wrong one, sorry. Wayne Rogers was never in the series. So there you go, dude. I don't know who that came from, but uh, there's a bit of contention there, old son. Well, IMDB tells me that he was. Well, oh. he was the character that changed from from one to the other. So Contention, contention. Do. There we go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And then uh, in the Lone Ranger, the black and white series, there was uh, Clayton Moore that played the Lone Ranger and then John Hart for a couple of seasons right towards the end. And there's a whole bunch of them. There's Six Million Dollar Man, the Superboy, Shazam. But anyway. Um, that brings me with the Lone Ranger. Classic question. Um, what's the closest thing to silver? The Lone Ranger's bum. So there you go. I thought I'd just chucked that in. Very, very good. Um, I like that. I mean, all these Robocop quotes keep chucking in. And, and, and Dave Barker, you've got some real concerns there, son, when you said I'll buy that for a dollar. So there you go. Um, <laughs> I like that. Ellie Wallach received more fan mail from Mr. Freeze than he did for any other show. Oh, there you go. So that's fantastic. And, um, yes, uh, decades after the fact. Very, very cool. So how about that? But anyway, yes, changing actors uh, for characters is uh, quite annoying. Anything else you guys want to add in before we move on? Actually, I was just thinking that show we did ages back about how the 80s had all the good quotes. I think David Barker's definitely supporting that uh, yeah, well, reasoning. Yeah, Dave will have to join us for our conversation a bit later on. So very, very good stuff. All right, so um, we've got 18 people watching, which is absolutely fantastic, and that's an excellent time for me to bring up this. Now, so last week I had mentioned uh, that uh, we were going to make this gigantic announcement this episode regarding you know, for MPS and myself, um, and uh, it was like a really, really big thing, and it's all very exciting. Now, just for anybody who's been falling asleep at the wheel and wasn't aware of what was going on, uh, we actually have uh, a big thing going on. So if you didn't read, and I'll get this up there soon. So for those who don't know it, um, there's actually a documentary that was uh, made over the past few years regarding um, uh, Batman collecting, and MPS and myself were featured uh, in it quite uh, heavily. So... 
Um, the uh, link to the show is actually um, on the Talk Nerdy to Me page, just a couple of messages below our current one. And for those who didn't look at it or didn't pay much attention to it or anything like that, um, uh, yes, the film itself will actually be pre pre premiering at the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival online, so you don't have to, have to physically go anywhere, uh, I believe, at the end of the month. And I thought I'd just spend a moment or two um, just sort of like uh, discussing about uh, what it was all about. So MPS, just uh, we'll keep it pretty brief, but uh, what were your thoughts on, on the production of it all? I thought it was pretty good. It was a very interesting way to do a doco. Um, when you do watch it, you'll see that it's, it is us two talking, mostly Dags, uh, and then I sort of come in, I don't know, halfway through sort of thing and we could continue on the chat about collecting and what it's all about. Uh, but there's the animations that um, Michael did for this, which I thought were really sort of good. And yes, it took us um, what, four or five years to, yeah. to do, you know, to have this production made. And I could see where the time was taken, uh, especially with the, the other stuff. So when Dags and I are talking in like a voiceover, you'll see uh, some animation type movements and it's very, very cool. I really, really did like it. Um, yeah, after all this effort, it's good to see all this time. It's good to see the effort was put in and it wasn't one of those, you know, you wait for a doco for 10 years and it's pretty average, but this was actually quite good. So well done to Michael and his team for putting this together. Yeah, so for just a bit of background, and like what um, uh, Michael Herbert has said, he's already purchased the ticket. Well done. And he'll be take, driving to the venue in his uh, yellow uh, SSS stanza. I saw pictures of that recently. He's his Datsun, which is fantastic. Um, yes, yeah, so the guy who made this actually lives in Sydney, and he actually contacted us originally. So it's not like we said, oh, you know, let's boost our own egos, MPS and I, and make our own document. No, this guy actually guy contacted us, and uh, we made uh, various trips down to Melbourne to uh, – shoot various uh, interviews and all the rest of it and return every couple of years. And uh, I'd always said to um, Michael, I mean, for his sake, I hope he can actually get it all finished and I hope it'll work out well. And I hope, hopefully an audience is happy to listen to MPS and myself gag along the way we do. But uh, it's all done now. Uh, and there is actually a website for it if you haven't been there already, batmanandme.com. Uh, and there are clips there and you can see little snippets and photos and whatever else. So um as i said to michael i really hope from his perspective that he gets his return on investment because he had to traverse his way down here every single time bring a crew with him um and he always stayed in his own accommodation and even brought his photographer down from queensland i thought bloody hell like that photo you're looking at uh there on the top left is actually from that lady in uh, Ange coots i think her name is and uh so yeah it's a bit of time and effort put into it but it's finally finished and uh, with a bit of luck, it, um, it'll do very well for itself for Michael's benefit. So I thought we'd spend a bit of time just chatting about it because two days ago we were told we're allowed to officially promote it now uh, and tell everybody about it. And uh, it premieres uh, in about 15 years' time. Is there a director's cut with commentary? Actually, Colin, um, we were not involved with the production at all. So we may be part of the subject matter, but in terms of how it was made, when it was made, how it was edited, we were not involved at all. In fact, until... About three weeks ago, actually not even that, I think it was only two weeks ago, a couple of last week, um, I didn't even know it had been done. So uh, we hadn't been involved with any of the production side, like any of the footage or whatever. And so until we saw it, NPS and myself, we had no idea what it was going to be about. So, um, but uh, there you go. So Colin, you got to go next Wednesday, go to my place and open up all my Batman, Batman toys, eh? Yeah, good luck with that, son. So uh, there you go. And I like that little gag. Someone has written, NPS is going to be played by Wayne Rogers. <laughs> That's very so there you go. Actually, when you when you think about it, I mean, can you actually think of a documentary that has a commentary on it? I mean, it's not really necessary to have a, a commentary on a documentary. Yeah, you're right. The Fandom Menace actually has one, uh, if you have the DVD for it. Um, so that was from way back when. Uh, they did a commentary with uh, Chris and Shane, but that's the Star Wars one from the year 2000, uh, if you can get your hands on that. If not, you can just go to YouTube and watch the uh, doco from there. But, uh, um, yes, in terms of will they have a streaming re uh, streaming release, I don't know, Deacon. We're not involved with anything in regards to its release. All we got told, um, Michael had been trying for ages to put it into a film festival all around like various parts of the world and of course all the festivals are now shut down they're all like online only or they're not even happening and this was the very first one uh that he was happy to get it into and even though michael lives in sydney he said it was really good to have it in melbourne because you know it's obviously a melbourne-based story um which is kind of groovy but uh yeah so we certainly wish him all the best with it uh as in michael the guy who made it and um hopefully when people watch it they enjoy it so uh Did he, there um... you go. 
did he say anything about why he chose the title? Because it it's very familiar to me, like the Bill Finger documentary sort of had a very same um, sort of title. Yeah, I thought that too, because um, originally I asked him, I said, what are you going to call it? And he said he wasn't too sure. Batman and Me is actually the Bob Kane autobiography. Bob Kane, yeah. Is. And um, uh, and I thought, oh, okay, could be, you know, some people might find it a bit contentious, a bit questionable. I had no involvement with that whatsoever. Um, but that's what he picked. And I thought, oh, okay, well, then so be it, Jedi. So uh, there you go. Uh, and whoever's asking, uh, it's Fandom Menace. It's Fandom with PH, but it's a D instead of a T in the middle. So it's Fandom Menace. So if you look it up on YouTube, uh, yeah, you can see that. And it's an excellent documentary from that Star Wars Club in the early 2000s. Um, I got pulled from the shelves. Uh, Jared, uh, no, actually, I never collected Joker merchandise. I only collected Batman merchandise only. It's actually covered in the documentary. I refuse to uh, collect any other character. So doesn't matter. Not even Robin, anybody. Just I just never did. So there you go. Very good stuff. Um, how much are you charging for autos and photo ops? Well, they, I hadn't thought of that. What do you reckon, MPS? Like do a bit of a dual thing together? Or I don't know. How much, how much are you willing to pay, Colin? <laughs> I was going to say, you should be you should be paying us. Yeah, yeah. Well, exactly right. So there you go. <laughs> but uh, so for um, for uh, not just for Michael's sake, but for uh, documentary filmmakers' sake, uh, yeah, support him and go to the website. Uh, the link is actually in the post that I put in for the Melbourne Film Documentary Film Festival, and you can go from there. So uh, very, very groovy. So very cool. All right, see you next week for a bit of Star Wars action on My Slicely Monthly. So until then, make sure you all stay nerdy. Okay, stay bye. Nerdy. Bye. See ya.